the biggest red flags that that I would not have done today that I did before it was selling a strangle in a low IV stock that has a low expected move. Anything can happen with earnings in that I think you have to realize that like you're dealing with a company with CEOs and a board and all of this public exposure. So take that and realize that that can be a contributing factor. Um, but also the trade was too big. This is the How to Trade Stocks Options Podcast, brought to you by 10MinuteStockTrader.com, where we cover finance, stocks, options, entrepreneurship, education, and money. And here's your host, voted one of the top 100 people in finance, Christopher Ewell. Today's episode is produced in partnership with FinClub.ai. Trade with confidence and take the guesswork out of trading with FinClub's artificial intelligence platform. Now you can get access to the best AI trading platform on the market for as little as $19 per month. That's almost the price of Netflix. So head on over to finclub.ai to start your two week free trial right now. Remember, that's at finclub.ai. Hey, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so you'll be notified every time we give you more tools, tips, and tricks to help you trade faster and trade smarter every single week. Hey there, traders. Welcome back to today's How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast. Today, I have a special guest online, Mike Butler. Mike is one of the show hosts over at tastytrade.com. And I'm, I'm really excited to talk to Mike today. I've talked to half a dozen of his colleagues, but never got a chance to talk to him. So Mike, thank you so much for coming on the line today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. Like, like I said earlier, um, I've had a chance to talk to Tom Sosnoff, Tony Batista, um, who else has been on the podcast? Jim Schultz, uh, Ryan Grace, uh, Pete Molmet. Man, I, I, the list goes on and on. And, and, and I'm very fortunate to be able to have had a chance to talk to all of them. And now, now it's your turn, it looks like. So, <laughs> Mike, do, do us a favor. Give us a little background about who you are and how you came to Tasty Trade and, and what, what life is like as a, as a Tasty Trader. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I live in Chicago, born and raised here. Um, I, I'm very fortunate to have the Tasty Trade offices here. Uh, otherwise, you know, who knows where I'd be. But... Um, I actually didn't learn about options trading until about seven years ago, seven, eight years ago. So I went through high school, went through college, knew nothing about options trading, period. But I did play poker uh, a ton. I've had some success playing poker. And what's nice about playing poker well and understanding how to play poker well is very similar to the Tasty Trade methodology of selling premium and or just putting yourself in a situation where you have a high rate of success and you're giving up some of that, those home run hitters, those max profit potential to increase that win rate. So um, the, the concepts were very similar and I was able to pick up on it pretty quickly. Um, but as you know, my little brother used to work at Tasty Trade first. So oh. Chris was on the research team um, and my mom would send me videos of him on Tasty Trade talking about implied volatility and puts and calls. I, and I had no idea of what these things were. So I was like, well, I can't have this. Like my little brother's practically famous in the space. He's on this show. Like, what am I doing here? So I started learning. He kind of showed me the ropes. Um, and eventually one day just visited the office. And this was after I had been going through, you know, best practices, market measures. I was basically just binge watching shows. Um, I met the whole crew at Tasty Trade, and just so happened that one of their key support people had left like three days before. So they're like, listen, your brother vouches for you. We know that you're learning about options trading. Um, we need more people. So if you want to apply, you can apply. And so I did, took the job. Um, so I, I started at Tasty Trade just as you know a support person answering emails. And really, that's that I think I can attribute to learning so quickly, just going through the motions of answering questions all day and literally hundreds of emails a week, all regarding options trading. Um, so that's how I got in, got my foot in the door in Tasty Trade. But I think the funny story is how I started broadcasting. So my first show, Mike and his wife board, um, which is you can find it on YouTube. It's pro it's one of the more popular things on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um, outside of other things we've got out there. But um, through my learning, I was able to teach some of my colleagues that we were hiring um, through whatever it was, business or advertising. Um, and they were, they were basically onboarded to Tasty Trade, but they weren't options traders. So I was like, well, 
I might as well try and help you understand just the basics of options trading so you can you know, market better, you know, advertise better, whatever your job is. So I would pull these people into a conference room for like an hour every day. And we had this tiny little whiteboard and I would draw the concepts and strategies and basically show them how these things worked. And eventually Tom barged in the door and was like, what are you guys doing for an hour like every day? You're just like in here, like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I'm teaching them how to trade options. I'm just te teaching them the fundamentals. And he's like, well, is it helpful? And everyone was like, yeah, it's great. Like, it's, it's good. And he's like, well, you're going to do it on air now. And I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the funny story of how um, I backdoored into broadcasting on Tasty Trade and um, created the visuals for Mike and his whiteboard, which really the production team is the reason why it became popular, just because they made it look so nice and it was, it was a nice, smooth show. Um, run on a green screen. Um, so, yeah, that was that was kind of my foot in the door in Tasty Trade, my foot in the door in broadcasting, and the rest is history from there, as they say. So, so yeah, you're totally right. When when you Google Tasty Trade, there's a lot of Mike and his whiteboards that come up. I, I've personally seen that many times. So, did you? You were saying that you know you couldn't have your little brother stealing the show. So, were you <laughs> were you wanting to be on air? Was that was that your goal there? I really wasn't, um, but I'm kind of a yes man. I'm not really someone to shy away from a challenge. So um, when Tom was like, let's do it on air, I was like, okay, like this could be cool because back in those days, like five, six years ago, when you would go onto YouTube or you would go try and search for options trading information, all you got was someone talking in the background and you would they would just show their platform. Mm -hmm. And it's really tough especially as a new person, like understanding these concepts, understanding these strategies, and just seeing red and green flashing numbers everywhere. You don't really conceptualize what you're looking at. And that was my biggest struggle in the beginning um, until I found Tasty Trade where they had some visuals, but not uh, to the extent that uh, we create them now. So I think that was one of the big missing points in the industry, at least for the, from an educational side. And it was something that I was fine with, you know, taking the challenge and, and conquering. And luckily, we just had the perfect storm of a great production team and just a great way to visualize these concepts. And we were able to go from there. Yeah. And, and that was super successful. So that was just like your, your gateway drug into the world <laughs> of broadcasting, right? That's and now right. You, you've been on many shows, right? So, so I used to watch Tasty Trade religiously. Uh, but I haven't so much lately. But I mean, I know you've been all over the place, right? So what what shows are you doing today? So right now, uh, we have a show called Market Mindset, and that's with myself, Katie McGarrigal, and Nick Batista. And that was a show that kind of just generated from uh, similar to what you're doing, like figuring out a way to. Uh, engage people in trading, whether it's options trading, futures trading, stock trading, whatever it is, but doing it in a digestible way with current market information. Um, so that's market mindset. We talk about earnings trades, we refresh strategies, concepts. Uh, some of the more popular segments we do are actually viewer question segments. We'll you know, shoot it out to Twitter and, and have people send us questions and then We'll answer them on air and walk through the platform, walk through the concepts and strategies um, and do that there, which which kind of is a carrot into something that's I'm really excited about starting on Monday. Uh, I'm actually starting a new YouTube show called Options Trading Concepts Live. So it's going to be very similar to that where I'm going to go through concepts, go through strategies, but I'm going to have uh, engagement with live chat. So that's something I've always wanted to do. Um, was kind of create like a, a literal classroom format where people can ask questions, I can answer them live rather than going back and then sending you know a link to the segment. So I'm super excited for that. Uh, and I think it's going to be really powerful. So is that still going to be on Tasty Trade or is that just like a YouTube only thing? It'll be on YouTube. Um, if you want to chat, you'll have to go to YouTube, just the YouTube Tasty Trade channel, but it'll be broadcast on Tasty Trade if, gotcha. if someone just wants to watch or listen. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So so you make me now wonder, what are some of the most oddball questions that you get? Because I'm sure you get <laughs> a lot. You're like, we can't use this. What are they thinking, right? Yeah. So so, so give me a couple of those, at least some of them that, uh, that may have stuck in your memory, because now, now I got to know. 
<laughs> um, some of the, the weirdest questions I get are, um, of course, you know, people want to quit their jobs. They have $1,000. They want to quit their jobs. They hear that they can make, you know, 10 grand a month with their $1,000. And they're like, how do I do this? It's like, well, unless you're just like hitting all these home runs, it's really, it's really tough. Like even if you're trading the other side of options trading, if you're buying options, you still have to be correct more often than not, even with the leverage that you get. So um, that's probably the number one weird question I get. Or with options trading, people would be like, I want to take a small amount of risk, but have a huge potential payout and do so, you know, more frequently than not. And it's like, well, we talked about this today. Like you got, at some point you have to take some risk if you want that profit. Like there's not really a, a trade that has no risk and all the profit in the world unless you start with some risk and then you can, you know, remove that risk through hedging, uh, like a broken wing butterfly, turning it into a regular butterfly, something like that. Um, but yeah, those are probably the top two where it's just like, you know, I wish this were a thing, but if this were a thing, I wouldn't be here. I'd be, you know, on an Island somewhere just right. making these trades all day. You know, that, that actually leads me into one of the things that, that I struggled with and super failed at when uh, I started trading. Um, I've mentioned many times in the podcast how I blew up my account twice before I figured things out. One of the things that took me out was the the concept of this is how much risk is going to be in a trade. So let's say I have just a one contract, $5 wide put credit spread. And I took in, for example, $100 on the trade. So I'd have $400 of risk. To me, that $400 in risk was spent. That was going to be my risk in the trade. And I didn't care about anything else in that. And I would lose it a lot. <laughs> I was terrible. But then I figured out along the way about like having, and I know this is not a, a tasty trade philosophy, but it's definitely a philosophy that I use. And, and having interviewed a lot of traders, uh, some, some charting things behind it, right? I'm not a huge believer in support and resistance, but I am cognizant that you can back test different moving averages. And those moving averages seem to show a lot of historical support, I guess you could say. I hate using the word support. I like the term like using moving average versus support. But for me, like let's say I'll sell a put spread, same example, $4 in, uh, in risk, $1 in, in, in credit received. If it works against me and it goes on the other side of that uh, moving average, I'm gonna get out. And I may only lose 20 bucks on the trade or $40 on the trade. And that I think was the real game changer for me is that I am not risking $400 in trade. I may put up $400 in margin, but there is zero chance that I'm going to lose $400 on this trade unless I wake up tomorrow and the whole market's crashed and nobody can help that anyway. Yeah. So that's one way that I, and, and certainly not everybody has to or does do this, but it's one way that I decided that I was going to allow myself to just not be trading as risky as I was. So with that being said, I know that charting is not something you guys explore really so much with Tastyworks. Have you guys ever considered that? Um, so I would say yes and no. I mean, the Tastyworks platform has a ton of moving average um, indicators. They've got, I would say like, I want to say like 100 indicators, something like that. If mm. I'm just look, thinking about scrolling through the list. Um, but I agree with you. I think it's not going to be your be all end all. And I think it can, it can potentially be dangerous for people that think that it is the be all end all. Like when something's at a support line, I'm just going to go nuts and just make a huge trade yeah. because it's going to bounce from here. Like I, that's another thing I get all the time is like the stock is going to go up because it's here and this is what I'm seeing. And it's like, well, you can think that, but you can't prove that to me and you never will be able to. So um, I think that's something that, you know, take it with a grain of salt. If you like using moving averages, you like using Bollinger Bands and it helps you create trades or structured trades. And it more importantly makes you feel more comfortable with the trade, then by all means go for it. I think if you're going to use technical analysis or fundamental analysis, but you also are cognizant of the fact that you can be wrong and you will be wrong, not all the time, but eventually you'll be wrong with your assumption. Is your trade uh, going to be able to withstand that? Or is your position sizing going to be able to withstand that? And are you knowledgeable enough to manage the position going forward? Like in the example of a put credit spread, if you're selling it out of the money and all of a sudden your stock price moves towards your short strike, well, 
you don't necessarily have to just hold that position. You could roll it out in time, collect another credit, give yourself more time to be right. And then what's nice about that is if you continue to see movement against you, the further out in time you are, you're literally your number one asset is extrinsic value with spreads, where even if your spread goes in the money, like you said, if you have 35 to 50 days on your contract, even if your spread's completely in the money, it's not going to be trading for that max loss. It's going to be trading for, you know, two bucks, a dollar, something like that, where you, you're able to get out if your assumptions change for much less than max loss. And if you continuously do that and you never accept max loss, which is something that you know, I, like you, I don't think there's ever a reason to take max loss on a spread. It's just that there's too many things you can do to avoid that. So, uh, and then what are you left with? You're left with the easy winners that you forget about. You know, you close them and you're, you move on to the next trade. So, yeah, I think position sizing, making sure that that's in check, making sure you're, you're able to withstand bad weeks, bad months. Um, but then just understanding how extrinsic value is your friend in so many different ways. Um, and, and being mature enough and um, conscious enough to get out of a trade that is no longer a good trade. So, yeah, oh, yeah. I totally agree. I think there's, there's so many ways you can get around absorbing a max loss and especially with spread trading uh, even though max loss is certainly higher than just selling the put and realizing a loss that's equivalent to your buying power um, there's so many things you can do and there's there's so much content out there that you can use to to expand your knowledge base especially for specific strategies that you know there's there's plenty of ways to get around you know that that four hundred dollar loss that seems bad but it's it's really a low probability event right right yeah, it it took me a while to to come with the the terms of I I don't have to hold this until expiration. I can actually do something about it. And mm -hmm. uh, once I figured that out, it made life a lot easier and a lot less stress. Right. So Definitely. so one thing that I was really guilty of is like let's say the stock's going up. Right. I remember specifically this one one particular example. Right. I felt that I was a quote contrarian trader. And I know that that term gets thrown a lot around a lot. And I, I, I don't know if it's always meant to be in this way, but the way that I took it was if a stock's going up, well, you better believe I'm selling calls against that. If a stock's <laughs> going down, you better believe I'm selling puts against that. So, so the story that I had in mind is I was, I was at the library with my son. He's, you know, going through all the little kid books and I had my phone and I saw the NASDAQ was up. And uh, this was a few years ago when like it didn't go down. I'm like, I'm going to sell some calls against it. It makes total <laughs> sense to me. And like from the moment I put that on until who knows how many weeks later to the moment I took it off, it never for a second was down a penny and like just total loser the entire way. And I was like, I don't think I got this tray and trader thing down. I feel like I think I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> do you do you do you take that approach? Because I know a lot of the people at Tasty Trade consider themselves and and very vocal about I'm a contrarian trader. And like I said, there's definitely a lot of different ways to take it, and I took it the wrong way. Yeah, I totally hear you. I mean, um, when it comes to contrarian trading, for me, it. Uh, is a lot more to the downside. I'm much more comfortable selling a put in something in some stock that's sold off and something that I'm willing to roll into perpetuity until I'm potentially right. Like uh, United Airlines is a great example. I, I had a strangle in there for earnings. The stock shot up after earnings. I managed it, rolled it into a straddle at 45 with the intention and knowing that uh, even if the stock dropped, I'm comfortable having a short put at 45 and I can just get rid of the call and just lean long for the next couple months, keep rolling and rolling and rolling. And that's where I'm at right now. So I have a short put in UAL, 45, I think the stock's at like 37, but I've collected $5.75 along the way. So my break even is below 40 and I'm totally comfortable holding a long position or a, a bullish position rather than a bearish position, especially in today's day and age. And I think the big, the best thing you can do is recognize what's going on in the market, recognize what's going on with society. And I think the number one reason you're seeing these massive, massive moves to the upside and downside is not only because the S&P and the NASDAQ are made up of a small group of companies that are all tech companies pretty much that are just going nuts in this quarantine society where everyone's at home using their computers. Um, but also 
because everyone's at home, uh, people are learning about finance. Like the finance boom has is now. Like that this is what it is. You can look at, you know, our YouTube views have spiked just from people watching. And I think just the YouTube space alone, I'm sure all views across the board have spiked. You can probably speak to this too, where yeah, absolutely. podcast listen, listening has, has spiked. Like everything is spiking. So the more interest there is, the more that can potentially move a market. And especially to the upside with these big name tech stocks, like you look at Shopify or Tesla, like all the big name, you know, household cool stocks are the ones that are just ripping through the roof. And there's a reason for that. So um, from a contrarian standpoint, uh, yes, I, I do believe in the power of it. If you understand what a, a good position might be to get into it. Um, but on, if I'm bearish something on an up move, I'm also going to look at extrinsic value skew. Because if a short put that's 20 points out of the money is trading for three times the amount as a short call that's trading 20 points out of the money where they're equidistant. And I assume the markets are random in general. Um, if I'm look, if I'm looking at that extrinsic value skew and the puts are trading for much more, I can actually set up like a long put spread or a put diagonal spread where I'm buying that put in the money, paying very little extrinsic value, selling a put that's out of the money, collecting a ton of extrinsic value and creating an equidistant spread where I'm actually paying less than 50% of the width of that spread. And that's all because of skew. So uh, I'm much more cautious with con being contrarian in a bearish standpoint, and I'm much more aggressive with being contrarian on the downside or, or being bullish, because typically you're gonna see that skew, you're gonna get paid more to sell that put than the call. Um, so I'd much rather define my risk if I'm gonna be bearish and have an undefined risk position if I'm gonna be bullish. Oh, that that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it it definitely took a lot of time for me and a lot of money to uh, figure out the way that I needed to be trading. And it sounds like like you have found what works for you. What what do you feel is one of like the biggest takeaways that because I mean, you've you've obviously been an educator in this space for a long time. What's like the number one thing that Mike Mike and his his whiteboard today would say? Like, if if he could only talk about one bullet point, what would that bullet point be? Um, really, honestly, um, cost basis reduction is your best friend, and it, it always goes back to understanding that you can have an assumption, but your assumption can be wrong. Um, and also just, just playing for the, the long term, I think is another thing. So we like to sell premium that's 45 days out, which is pretty near term. But in most of the positions that I place, I have the intention of holding that position for a long time if it goes against me, because I've developed the skill over time. I know I can turn a strangle into a straddle, go inverted, et cetera, et cetera just continuously manipulate the risk reward range and maximize that extrinsic value that I'm collecting. Um, and I, it takes time to develop that, but I th think the number one thing to focus on is cost basis reduction. Um, and really the best way to think about it is like if I'm only, if I buy hundred shares of stock and I want, I'm bullish on the stock, that's great, but you don't really have any, anything else working in your favor. So maybe consider, selling a put to get into the shares of stock, where if the stock moves sideways, the put's gonna outperform. If the stock moves down, the put's gonna outperform. If you eventually take the shares, your basis is gonna be so much lower than if you had just bought the shares outright. And now you can you know, sit on the shares, ride them back up, sell a call against it if you want to. There's so many things that you can utilize to better your probability of, of success. Uh, and that's really cost basis reduction and having extrinsic value decay in your favor. And the, the tie for number one is definitely giving yourself time to be right in a position. Because there's, so there's so many situations where people will place this huge position and it'll go against them and they'll freak out and close it where it's like an out of the money option that they sold. And then the extrinsic value in that option expands where if they would have hold, held the position or traded a little bit smaller, so that they didn't have that freak out moment and realize, well, if my option is still here and the stock is wherever it is, if the option is out of the money, all, 
all this value is going to be zero at expiration. Like this is going to be a profitable trade, but if you're trading too big and you're not giving yourself enough time to realize that, um, you're you're going to be basically creating and booking losses on positions that would be profitable if you just held it a little bit longer. So uh, I would say cost basis reduction and giving yourself time to be right and just being patient um, would be the the two things that that I'll always hold near and dear to my heart when I'm trading anything or doing anything. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So, so what would you feel would be the catalyst for you to say, all right, I'm done with this trade, right? I mean, like for your, your United Airlines example, um, you know, it, it worked against you. You've done some managing, you've rolled some things out. Mm -hmm. Like at what point does Mike say, I'm done with this. I'm out. See you later. So in the case of a short put, the answer is probably it's not going to happen. Just really? because, yeah, um, and really, unless the the airline goes out of business, like that's <laughs> probably where I'd say, you know, I'm done because they're done. Um, but I was actually talking about this with Lindsay, um, who I, I do a show with also, not right now, but we will when we go back to the, the studio. Uh, it's called Where Do I Start Young Money? And it's basically, you know, I'm just, we're, we're walking through trading and the basic concepts. And she actually had a, a short put in American Airlines and she sold it at like 19 and the stock was at 10. And she's like, should I just close this? Like, this is, this is annoying to look at. And I'm like, well, think about it this way. Like you've already realized a 50% drop in the stock price from where you sold the put. So what's your worst case scenario? You realize uh, another 50% drop. And what's that scenario? The stock literally is at zero. So for me, like if United Airlines goes down to, to 20 again, I'm going to still stay in the position. I might try and manipulate that position by, you know, rolling the strike down, maybe going to a straddle or not a straddle at the money, but an in the money straddle where I'm collecting some call premium to kind of push that break even lower and lower. But in the case of a short put, the lower the stock price gets, the less likely I'm going to exit, which is kind of counterintuitive. But when you think about it from a macro perspective, where is that? Where else is the stock going to go? If it goes to zero, I've already felt that pain. You know, I've already felt this huge pain. So I'd rather risk the additional pain than book the loser and then look at the stock six months from now and see it above 45. So, well, let uh, me ask you this. And, and so that pain you're describing right there is what I went through. And so that's why my trading plan changed significantly. Why not? Why not? Let's say if it goes from 45 to 43 mm -hmm. and it looks like it's fallen and things are, are not looking well, why not just take your, your small loss instead of holding it and feeling that pain, right? And then having to have it, you know, for months at a time, rolling it out. And maybe eventually we've collected enough credit to get to a break even point. Yeah. Why not take the small loss? I totally hear you there. And really, so right now my break even is not far from the stock price. And because I've collected so much along the way that if we do get another rally and I'm able to close it for a small profit or a scratch, I'm going to do that because it goes to your point. Like you have to remember, this is a position that literally just vaporized you like up and down in my case. So I'm going to exit the position for a small profit or a scratch or even a small loss. If I can make back a couple hundred more bucks, I have no problem with that. But if all of a sudden the stock drops significantly intraday or before the market opens, that's a scenario where I would prefer not to close it because I feel like I would rather just lean long in that scenario and just see, see what happens. But I agree with you. If I get a move towards my break even or I, I'm able to close it for a small loss or a scratch or a small profit, I will do that because you have to remember this is a position you've been defending for three months, at least right. in this case. Yeah. And, you know, that's what's great about trading is that, I mean, your style works for you and my style works for me and, and the audience, their, their style works for them, or hopefully it does. You know, everybody has their own way to profitability and, and there, there's a lot of Wall Street tuition, I guess you could say, that goes along with it. What would you feel has been the biggest learning trade that you've ever gone through because i could tell you mine let me let me tell you mine real quick so okay. to warm you up for it okay so this was i feel like it was 2015 maybe 2014 um this is one of the times i blew up my account uh gold was going down which it's doing the opposite of that now gold was headed 
and it was headed down. I think I, I think I went long gold at probably thirteen twenty somewhere in that range, and then it fell basically ever since the day that I bought. So so what I had done was I had sold a uh, a put broken wing butterfly, which as you know has a, a very small amount of upside profit potential. But if it goes down some, then it has a, a much greater profit potential. But then if it goes down below that, you have a much, much larger loss potential. And so with that being said, I, I made a total bonehead move and I put on twice the size as I normally do, just like accidentally. And I'm like, you know what? No big deal. It's going to work <laughs> out even better for me when gold turns around because I'm calling the bottom based on nothing. Based on, like I said earlier, just the, the quote, contrarian trading. Mm -hmm. uh, gold's going down. It's got to go back up. I'm going to say this is the bottom here. And you know what? If it goes down just a little bit more, I'll make more money. And, and I put on twice the size as I normally do. Everything is golden in this trade. <laughs> we went to Disney World, came back, and like my, it was just like murder in my account. Everything has gone wrong. It, it, it could not have gotten worse at that point. And I'm like, what have I done? I just... Like it was 60% of my account in one trade within like three weeks. And I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> How could I let this happen? Right. And so that was one of the times where I'm just like, I'm going to put my hat up for a while and just sit and learn and try and figure things out. Cause it, that one really tore me up. Cause like I did so many things wrong, right? Just trading against the trend in this case, putting on twice the size as I normally would have done, really not having any clue as to what I was going to do if it did go against me. And it did all the way. And so that was one of my like biggest Wall Street tuitions that I had to pay. So so I lead into that story to see what 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 kind of tuition did you have to pay before you finally felt like, oh yeah, this is for me. Um so I have two separate stories. So okay. the first one has to do with uh, selling credit spreads for earnings announcements. So I used to sell at the money spreads with like one day to go in the weekly and a couple of them were, were great, but a couple of them were, you know, max losses. Like those are the scenarios where you can realize max loss when you're trading weekly credit spreads with zero time left and you don't have extrinsic value trading on your side. If you're wrong, um, that was one of the big learning experiences. So I, would sell like an at the money five point wide spread. I'd collect, you know, two bucks or 250. And all of a sudden the stock would drop and I would take a loser and I'd be like, okay, what, how can I improve this like thought process? Cause there, this is so binary in nature. Like I don't really have anything working in my favor. So I was like, well, why don't I look at the monthly cycle instead of selling the weekly cycle? So I look at the monthly cycle and I was shocked. I was like, the premium is literally the same. And if I, if you get a bullish move, you're still going to make money. You're not going to make as much money because there's time value associated with those contracts. But more importantly, if you're wrong, if you want to exit the trade, you can, and you're not going to realize max loss because of like we talked about before, you're going to have time on your side. And that's really with credit spread trading and defineders trading, time, having time on your side is really your best asset other than, you know, not making the profit range too narrow. Um, so that was lesson number one. I stopped selling weekly credit spreads after that. Uh, the exception to that rule is like broken wing butterflies. If I want to do one for earnings, I just did one in Baidu yesterday, closed that today for 50 cent winner. Um, but those are the exceptions because you have a long spread that's embedded into your short spread that's financing it. So you, you want extrinsic value to be really low in that case. Um, but yeah, that, that was like my, one of my light bulb moments with spread trading. The more important one was last year, I think it was last year, Facebook had an earnings announcement and they just were abysmal. I remember that. Um, Dropped yeah, like 25%. Think, yeah. 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 So unfortunately, I sold a strangle in there and there were so many red flags. Like looking back, there's so many red flags about the trade. So um, if you watch Market Mindset now or you look at the earnings trades that I do, if I'm selling undefined risk premium, I'm always going twice or three times the expected earnings move, just so that if the stock even moves to the expected range, I, my options are still out of the money, 
even if the the side that the stock moves to stays you know around where i sold it the opposing side is going to lose all of its value and the trade will be net profitable so my favorite strategy for undefined risk is two or three times the expected range in selling a strangle in high implied volatility stocks so facebook was really not that high implied volatility i think it was probably like 25 percent for the month or 30 percent for the month which is nothing and i just sold it because i wanted to be in the trade and the expected move was low relative to the stock price. It's another red flag. I won't do that anymore. Um, and it's if you think about it logically, like if you have a two hundred dollars stock, which Facebook was, and the expected move is only ten bucks, that's only five percent of the stock price. So if you wake up the next day and you see that it's down twenty bucks, thirty bucks, would you really be surprised? And for me, the answer is no. But what is that move relative to the expected move? That's a two or three times the expected move in the stock. Whereas if Facebook's a $200 stock and the expected move is 20 points or 30 points, what would it take for you to realize a two or three times expected move? Now you're looking at 40 points or 60 points to the upside or downside. And for me, a $200 stock moving 40 or 60 points, that would surprise me. But apples to apples, it's literally the same percentage uh, move of the expected move. So I only really sell undefined risk premium in stocks that have really high expected moves, really high implied volatility for that reason alone. But as you know, Facebook dropped, it went from like 210 down to like 180 and then down to 160, 150, 140. And I was just rolling the put forward. I got rid of the call, I'm pretty sure, just rolled the short put forward. And I was like, this is a FANG stock, it's gonna recover, everything's gonna be fine. And really the position got too big to where I started getting emotional, where like every day that it was going down, I would just be furious. And I was like, I cannot believe that this is the case. And the position was too big for my account regardless. So that was another red flag. Um, but the worst mistake that I made was I ended up uh, getting out of the trade when Facebook was at like 140 or 145. So I basically took the loss and everything that I just talked about with United Airlines was a learning, a result of the learning from this Facebook trade. Like if I would have held the Facebook trade because it's Facebook, as long as it you know doesn't crumble to the ground, it's going to recover over time and look at it now. Where is it now? 210, somewhere around there. So I would have made all that intrinsic value back plus all the extrinsic value that I would have collected along the way. And I would have been in a much better scenario than just taking the loss because I was frustrated or taking the loss because the position was too big. So those are those are probably my top two that just stand out to me in my mind when you ask that question. But uh, again, trading small, cost basis reduction, giving yourself the ability to hold a position forever. Like these are all the things that will help you become more sustainably profitable because the more time you have, the more chance you give the stock price to move in your direction, wherever that direction may be. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, you, uh, you, you went through that hurting in a way that I, I would not have done, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we all go through it, man. There's, there's nothing, there, there's no successful trader out there at all who hasn't had those big moments where it's like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe you know that I, that I did this, right? or I can't believe that I didn't do this kind of deal. Right. And uh, I know a guy who uh, kind of the opposite situation of that Facebook trade, he he was long oil and this was years ago. And um, he kind of closed the trade because it wasn't working out for him. And then he later came back and he was doing the math and he's like, I would have made a million dollars on that trade or whatever it was. And it's like, <laughs> look, you cannot under any, this is my personal opinion. You cannot under any circumstance go back to the if onlys, right? Cause if only doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> the only thing that matters is what you actually did. The if only I had hold this, if only you had held Facebook for a little longer, maybe it would have went to 90. <laughs> That's right. That's true. I, so, you know, for me, like it's, it's the opposite, right? And and it's like, I'm cutting losers as fast as I can. Like today even, uh, I I was long Visa and Visa went below. And like I say, this is not tasty trade methodology, but it's my, my methodology and I'm okay with that. It went below its exponential moving average. I think it was this 10 day exponential moving average. And I'm like, all right, I'm out. Because I, I had back tested the, the 10 day exponential moving average and it does really well. And uh, I took a $19 loss on the trade. 
And I'm like, I'm totally good with that. And you know what? Next week, if Visa goes back over it, I'll do it again. And I'm really good with getting into that trade again. Because to me, like, I'm not looking at it on a per trade basis. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at it as like a per symbol basis. Mm -hmm. So like Visa over the year, what has that done for me, right? Microsoft over the year, what has that done for me? So when I can, when I can drop off and get a $19 loss and not worry about it over the weekend or anything like that, I'm going to do it every day. Just makes life a lot easier. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, like I said, everybody's got their own style. And for me, I, I am so good with taking those little losers. So I don't have to worry about them turning into another big loser as we've all had a chance to experience. Yeah, totally hear you. And really, I think outside of where the stock went and where it is now, my biggest, the biggest red flags that, that I would not have done today that I did before it was selling a strangle in a low IV stock that has a low expected move. Anything can happen with earnings and that I think you have to realize that like you're dealing with a company with CEOs and a board and all of this public exposure. So take that and realize that that can be a contributing factor. Um, but also the trade was too big. So I, if I wanted to trade it, it should have been an iron condor or something where it wouldn't have mattered because I would have been out of the trade and yeah. been done. So totally agree with you though. Whatever, whatever you need, whatever you use to make yourself feel, you know, comfortable and especially if you're back testing it that's that's the most powerful thing and obviously if you're if you're able to get in and out and you're trading small enough to where it doesn't affect you emotionally that's another huge component cuz the second you get emotional about a trade that's when you start chasing the loser it's just like you know standing at a blackjack table like you're the the moment you get emotional that's when you start pushing all your chips in and be like this is it this is where it's going to happen and you can't control what's going to happen. So you, you have to approach imperfect information with the mindset that you can have an assumption, but eventually you will be wrong. And if you are wrong, what is that going to do to your portfolio? Is it going to crush you or is it going to be a tiny little blip on the radar? Right. Absolutely. You know, I don't even trade earnings anymore. Uh, I got yeah. burnt so many times on it going against me. I was just like, I'm done with this. I used to do the, yeah. the iron condor thing. Uh, there was one time I, I sold an iron condor and uh, I think it was an AKMI or something like that. Yeah. Something Akamai, not, I think. Yeah. yeah. It's not super liquid, which is kind of the point of the story in this one. Uh, so I, I sold an iron condor in it on earnings and it was doing its thing. I think it even was like within its move. So the trade would have been profitable and I'm trying to get out. I'm trying to get out. I'm trying to get out. And I keep raising my, my uh, stop uh, limit order. And nothing's getting filled. Nothing's getting filled. And I'm like, you know what? Market order. It'll be fine. It's like three minutes after the market opens. <laughs> Holy crap. I was wrong on that one. Like it would have been a totally fine trade if I had waited a half hour or so when like liquidity had chilled out. But like the way it got filled, it was, it went from like a, let's call it like a $15 winner, just something to like a $200 loser. Just all of a sudden I'm like, what happened? And it was all literally because of like the market order right after earnings and everything was crazy. And I'm like, wow, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, I like to only trade earnings now that where I intend to stay in the trade. Like if it goes against me, fine, I'll just roll it out to the next month or roll within the cycle. Um, but I think it can be a, a good way to acquire assets. So like if you're a stock gatherer, earnings announcements boost up that implied volatility. And if you want to be long a stock at a certain point, you're going to get paid to take that risk. And if the stock rallies, you're still going to make money on the short put. But if it doesn't, you just collected premium. You can take the stock now at your basis that you want. And um, I think it's a, you know, it can be used as a way to just get into stock. And it's as simple as that. And um, I tell my friends that all the time. They're like, I want to learn this trading thing. I'm like, listen, just start with short puts because Everything that I've ever learned and every every email I've ever answered, short puts, you get so much premium for selling them. And most people are comfortable with being long stock. So if I were to, to say, learn one strategy of options trading and never look back, it's just selling puts and that's it. Like simple that, makes, that. that makes so much sense. Yeah, just the, the but you've got to size it appropriately, right? right? If you can't handle 100 shares of stock, you don't need to be selling the put. I mean, or right. a spread. But if you yep. can't handle 100 shares of stock and then you've got that leverage working against you, that's that's uh, that's not a good place to be. But I mean, if you want to be long at a certain price, then that's a great way to do it. Yeah, without a doubt. 
I've written a short guide on how you can use the triple stock profit system. It's the secret weapon every investor needs right now to change your financial future. And you can get it for free by visiting triplestockprofits.com or in the links below. Also, if you want to join a community of traders just like you, you can get free access to the elite membership that has even more resources to help you trade faster and trade smarter. Yeah. Well, Mike, I got to say, this has been a lot of fun being able to uh, to share some stories with you and, and learn a little bit about uh, about you and get you to, to help the audience out there as well. So, Mike, I want to tell people to come and watch you over on Tasty Trade. Where all can they find you since you, you, you said you're kind of all over the place right now and, and you're about to start a new show? Yeah, yeah. So um, we broadcast all day, every market day um, from 7 a.m. Central to 3 o'clock every single day on TastyTrade.com. So the video players right on the homepage there. My show specifically is Market Mindset. And that's at 11 a.m. Central to 12 every every single day. Um, and the YouTube show, which we're starting on Monday, will be on YouTube, but also on Tasty Trade, and that's starting at 3 p.m. Central Time. So I'll be talking about beginner options trading concepts, advanced, intermediate, earnings trades, the whole gambit. And um, if you have questions, that's going to be the place because I'm going to answer questions live. We'll pop over to the Tastyworks platform and walk through the questions live. I think it's going to be super powerful. Yeah, very, very cool, Mike. Thank you. Really, thank you for your time today. It's 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 been a pleasure to uh, to meet you and and to get your your insights and your perspective. And I mean, you you obviously know this stuff inside and out. So I would absolutely encourage the audience to first Google Mike and his whiteboard to see his biceps, and then <laughs> after you're done with that, head on over to Tasty Trade so you can watch the rest of them explain all these incredible concepts. Yeah. Mike, this has been a real pleasure. Um, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And thank you guys for tuning in to today's How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast. Make sure you like, subscribe, and enable notifications. That way you never miss any of the tools, tips, and tricks that we upload every single week to help you trade faster and trade smarter. And I'll see you on the next episode.